Well, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here in the university's own uh, hotel, and I thank uh, Timothy for inviting me onto the advisory uh, board of uh, Hong Kong Polytechnic uh, University, which I'm, of course, delighted uh, to serve on. Uh, what I want to talk to you about uh, this afternoon is uh, uh, the hot topic of intelligent machines. And I distinguish between two types of uh, intelligent machines, uh, the biological ones, uh, which, uh, <coughs> um, of course, were brought about by evolution. And now, for the first time in history, uh, the, the artificial ones, uh, which really are the uh, result of design. Uh, the content of my talk uh, is, uh, it, I start off with the third university mission, which is translation. I then give a few examples uh, uh, about uh, Cambridge, because that's where I live. That's where I uh, have the most experienced. Then I'll go into some of the details of what distinguishes a biological uh, intelligent machines from artificial intelligence machines. Uh, and I'll, I'll want to exemplify that in the way they, they think differently, in the way they see differently, uh, to pick one particular property of intelligent machines, and how this impacts on probably uh, the, the nearest term uh, effect that um, artificial intelligence and machine learning will have, and this is on autonomous cars. And then I'll go into some more uh, general aspects of AI and machine learning and what impact this has on disrupting a number of industry sectors in really quite uh, profound ways and, and very um, uh, quickly too. And as two examples that I will give is ARM, uh, our most successful uh, company in Cambridge, which produces all the microprocessors in your mobile phones, and then again, cars. So let's start with uh, translation as the third mission uh, of universities. We all know that uh, the number one uh, mission for universities, of course, is teaching. And I totally agree with Paul uh, that uh, the uh, graduates of the university are clearly the number one and most important product of the university. Uh, the second mission, uh, at least with some universities, uh, is research. These are the research universities. Uh, but more recently, uh, it's become clear uh, that universities have to be actively uh, involved in science translation. And this is the third mission that they have. I did some rough uh, back of the envelope calculations about the relationship between uh, the uh, importance of producing quality alumni, quality students as the product of the university, and producing IP, because there's a lot of excitement about the value of IP uh, that universities produce. And in the case of uh, Cambridge, if you just multiply the number of uh, <clears throat> Uh, graduates that we have every year uh, with the, uh, their ability to earn money uh, and the amount of money that we get from uh, licensing and spin-outs on the IP, the ratio is 100 to 1. So it is 100 times more important to have good students in terms of the income from the university. So universities often shouldn't get too excited about the amount of money that they get just from the IP. Having said that, if we then look at the value that these alumni create for society in terms of the companies they build, the employment that they create uh, once they've left the university, not necessarily with university IP, uh, the calculation uh, changes again very much in favor of the alum alumni and the impact that they have. I've been involved in uh, uh, helping to establish science translation initiatives in uh, the UK for some time. Uh, this was under David Sainsbury, who was the science, probably the most successful science minister uh, in the UK, who was science minister for a decade. And I contributed uh, with him on a report that I, I would all recommend to you called The Race to the Top, where we argued, I think, uh, correctly that uh, Western nations really have uh, only one way to go, which is uh, to innovate and to stay ahead of um, 
the curve by bringing up new innovative products and services. Uh, and this is a, a key mission for the university. We then studied technology transfer offices, and we will uh, come out with a report probably this autumn about uh, the, um, the best practice for technology transfer offices. And uh, we will recommend uh, a very simple formulaic uh, procedure for the IP that anybody who wants to start a company ought to be able to do so if he gives 5% of the equity to the university for all the IP that he can eat, he or she can uh, eat in the, uh, in the company. No questions asked, it's formulaic, uh, no negotiations, that's it. Um, the, the only um, further stipulation is uh, that the 5% is up to 1 million pounds into the company. Of course, they can't just get the 5% by putting 50,000 pounds into the company. Uh, I do distinguish between evolutionary and revolutionary ideas, um, and I will give some examples of that. And then uh, business angels and venture capital, of course, play a very important role when it comes to science translation. So why do I distinguish between evolutionary and revolutionary uh, breakthroughs in science? Well, evolutionary ideas are uh, fit extremely well into large uh, companies like Rolls-Royce, for example. Rolls-Royce roughly knows what airplane engines ought to look like over the next 10 years. And when there is a breakthrough in materials or uh, ideas of uh, uh, reducing fuel consumption, that all fits extremely well into uh, the Rolls-Royce um, projects. And Rolls-Royce is one of the prime examples where um, uh, translation of uh, basic science has worked extremely well. Rolls-Royce has a number of embedded uh, laboratories uh, all around uh, the country. I think there are 20 uh, at various universities, including uh, Cambridge University, and that's something that large companies do well. When it comes to revolutionary ideas, large companies are very bad. They normally screw it up. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, that revolutionary ideas are so different from the way big companies work uh, that they really don't fit into the way big companies think. Uh, they're revolutionary often in the sense that they work on comparatively small markets. And I actually give a talk, a different talk called The Six Waves of Computing, where I show, and this has now happened uh, five times already, uh, that the people who lead uh, one of the waves, say the um, uh, mini computer wave, which was dominated by DEC, they completely dominate the computer company, uh, dominated the computer company at the time. And towards the end of the wave, they always miss the next wave. The incumbents that dominate one wave always miss the next wave. Why is this? Well, they become so good at looking after their particular uh, market. Uh, they, they, they are the best mini computer company, and when Sun comes along with a, uh, with a, uh, a workstation, they just can't imagine uh, that this new uh, breakthrough uh, would work. Sun then completely dominated the workstation market, completely missed the PC market. Now, who would have thought that Intel and Microsoft, the duopoly in the PC market, would completely miss the smartphone market? It was unimaginable that Intel would not uh, be able to compete with a, with a little Cambridge company called ARM in the microprocessors for smartphones. Uh, but that's what happened. And the same thing is true for Tesla with electric cars. Who would have thought that a startup in California would produce the best electric car and not Mercedes or BMW or Toyota? But this is the case. There are two initiatives in the UK that uh, I've been involved in in terms of uh, translation. Uh, one is I co-chair the Science Industry and Translation Committee of the Royal Society. And this was a, a very interesting uh, initiative because uh, the Royal Society, the mission of the Royal Society, uh, right after its uh, founda foundation in the 17th century, was always to do the best science that they can, but also apply the science for the best of uh, society. And uh, the Royal Society Council felt that maybe it's become a little bit too esoteric and needs to refocus on its original two missions that it had and get closer to industry. And the second uh, initiative 
uh, was a report that I uh, wrote for the British government on technology innovation centers, which are now called, called catapults. And we've spent over a billion pounds on uh, building 12 of these catapults, which are intermediate institutions between universities and industry to help with the smooth translation of uh, research results into industry. Just a few words on uh, Cambridge. This is my college in Cambridge, King's College. And we have um, a good university in Cambridge. It's always in the top five. Uh, sometimes it even makes it into the number one slot. I think this year we're number four. Uh, we have an environment of 1,500 high-tech companies. But interestingly, only 70 of the 1,500 are spin-outs from the university. All the others are sneak-outs. So, uh, why is it that only such a small number of uh, uh, companies are actually uh, spin-outs? Well, first of all, most of these companies actually don't need any uh, university IP. Uh, they are just founded by very smart people that are graduates of the university. So although only 70 are official spin-outs of the university, I know of none of the 1,500 companies that don't have um, Cambridge alumni as key parts of their um, management team. We employ 53,000 pe uh, people, and 16 companies uh, now uh, have become companies that are so-called unicorns nowadays with a market capitalization over a billion dollars, but only six of them had anything to do with me. Uh, we also have a very active business community. Uh, there are two business angel communities, and we've got uh, a number of very active venture capital companies in Cambridge as well, including my own venture capital company, Amadeus Capital Partners. So now to intelligent machines uh, themselves. Uh, <clears throat> the building blocks of the different types of machines, the I always have the biological ones on the, on the left here with the neurons and the artificial ones on the right here. Uh, and that's, of course, built out of transistors. And these are the basic building blocks of uh, brains and computers. So let's compare them. Uh, let's look at the size. Well, neurons are roughly 20 microns in diameter. Transistors are now 20 nanometers. So uh, the transistors have it to the tune of 1,000 times. So transistors are 1,000 times smaller than neurons. Let's look at the speed. Uh, the maximum speed at which neurons can switch is about a kilohertz, 1,000 times a second. Uh, <clears throat> microprocessors typically uh, click along at uh, a gigahertz. So that's a million times faster. So again, big win for the artificial ones. A brain has a 100 billion neurons. Um, however, the best number of transistors that we can put on a chip is only 10 billion at the moment. So the brain actually has it by a factor of 10. Uh, the big difference, though, is the number of connections. Uh, that is the biggest difference uh, that we have at the moment. And as it turns out, the number of connections per neuron, which is typically 1,000 to 10,000, is the secret of our amazing uh, processing power. Because if we now come to the next slide, <clears throat> which is uh, how these two different uh, intelligent machines think, uh, then if we compare the brain with computers themselves, so yeah, here you have a, a typical brain. And as you can see, they're normally purple. And here on the right, uh, you have the components of, uh, uh, of uh, computers. Uh, this is a memory element. And I found a when I did research for this talk, I found a memory element that now has half a terabyte in this one gram uh, component uh, here with lots of chips on them, but it's a single, uh, it's a single uh, component. And this is the most powerful computer. It's a GPU that they have the, the most teraflops at the moment uh, to do the processing. And here are the numbers. Surprisingly, and I, I really didn't expect this, uh, the uh, memory capacity uh, that we can now produce with these units that I showed you uh, is now actually bigger than the memory capacity uh, of the brain if you take a kilogram of those. So there would be a 1,000 of those units that I showed you because they're only a gram. However, when it comes to the processing power, which of course is notoriously difficult to 
estimate the, the, the processing power of the brain, but the, the estimates are around 10 peta to one exaflop. That's uh, 10 to the 15 to 10 to the 18 floating point uh, operations per second equivalent. And the, the densest uh, and most powerful computer that we have is this uh, GPU that I showed on, on the previous slide. That's uh, 10 teraflops. So this is 1,000 times slower than the brain. So the brain is actually uh, the, 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 the most powerful uh, processing element in the universe still. However, this is still nothing compared with the amazingly frugal nature of the brain. So when it comes to the power consumption, uh, because our brains would fry and our brains would explode if we consumed more than 20 watt, evolution uh, made sure that we cannot consume more than 20 watt uh, with our brains. Uh, however, uh, we produce this amazing processing power with it. And the secret of it, of course, lies in the parallel n nature of our a processing arrangement in the brain. If I were to produce the equivalent um, processing power uh, with uh, these uh, artificial computers, I would end up with 200 kilowatts. So that's 10,000 times uh, less efficient uh, than the brain. So this is really uh, probably the most surprising result uh, that I came up with when comparing uh, biological with uh, artificial processing elements. Because of the great efficiency uh, that the brain has by using parallelism of the 100 billion neurons that we have, and because we've come to the end of Moore's law, at least in terms of the speed uh, of clocking our uh, microprocessors, <clears throat> the only way of making further progress in, in processing capability with artificial machines is to parallelize them. And uh, we believe uh, that this will require a third type of microprocessor in addition to the CPU, the central processing unit that all computers have for uh, running uh, programs, and the GPU, the graphical processing unit, uh, which is necessary to produce all these uh, uh, gra graphs, so the, the graphics that you see uh, on the display here. Uh, we now need an IPU, an intelligent processing unit, that is specifically designed to do AI and machine learning. And the way to do this is by having lots of processors on the same chip. In this particular case, uh, this is a, a company called GraphCore in Bristol in the UK uh, that is doing uh, uh, very well here. Uh, it will have 7,000 processors on a single chip with 350 megabytes of RAM. Uh, when it comes out later this year, it will probably be the largest chip in the world, and it is a breakthrough architecture, uh, which will be uh, about 100 times faster than the best uh, GPUs uh, that exist. So now let's uh, go down to a very specific uh, thing uh, that I want to compare between biological and artificial intelligent machines, and that is how we see well, of course, biological machines uh, see with their eyes, and um, artificial machines see with cameras. So let's compare those two. Um, the let's see if we nope. Uh, so. There is actually a comparison between, maybe it's here. Nope. OK. Um, if you compare eyes with cameras, uh, the cameras win easily, because the cameras have very much higher resolution down to an angstrom with electron microscope. Uh, they can. Uh, resolve the time domain much more. We typically can resolve uh, uh, maybe uh, 100 uh, milliseconds or so, but uh, we now have cameras uh, that can um, go down to picoseconds. And if you watch these cameras, it is absolutely amazing, as I'm sure all you know. The fastest speed we have on Earth is the speed of light. And these cameras are so fast that they can uh, film the, the, uh, the progress 
of light particles across the scene. So they're, they're so fast that they can freeze even light as it goes uh, across the scene. However, the single most interesting difference between the eye and the camera is the number of eyes that we have, which of course is two, and the number of cameras uh, that are now available to artificial machines, which is around 100,000 webcams uh, in the world. Uh, also, autonomous vehicles uh, benefit enormously from having uh, more than two eyes. Uh, they typically have uh, sort of between six and 16 uh, cameras uh, all around the car, and I will go into this uh, a little, in a little more detail. Apart from having the cameras that you have in the car yourself, of course, uh, if you have a connected car, and um, they're called CAVs because they're connected autonomous vehicles, people often forget that the connected part is just as important as the autonomous part, because if you've got a connected car, you then have access to all the CCTV cameras as well at the next crossing, uh, or you know, a, a few hundred yards ahead of you, so you know exactly what the traffic is going to be like there. And this is what uh, the car typically looks like if it's an autonomous car. Now, I need a, do we have a mouse uh, on this display? I don't know who is in charge, or we didn't try this beforehand. If somebody has a mouse, uh, and if they can just click on self-driving car, there is a video behind there. Just drive on, on uh, if you can just uh, put your mouse on, on this, on, exactly, yeah. no, up, 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 no. On where it says self-driving car, up a little more, up. <laughs> that's it, that's it, Try click it there. Okay, we don't have the link. Uh, don't worry. Uh, it's just a, um, it uh, would have been a video that shows you a Tesla car uh, as it drives down the street. And somebody said there is a problem with bicycles. And you will see uh, that uh, the car actually recognizes the bicycles very well. So uh, these, these, these cars uh, with the, the cameras, as you can see here, there are six cameras here, two on each side. Uh, so there's 10, that's 12, and two at the back. There are 16 cameras. Uh, there is radar, of course, on the front and LiDAR at the top. So uh, these cars actually have lots of cameras at different, um, uh, of different uh, sizes and with different ranges. So let's start here uh, with this uh, long-range radar. <laughs> this is for the adaptive cruise control so that you, you can adjust your speed depending on the distance to the car in front. Uh, then the, the, the uh, dark gray one here is the, is the LiDAR, uh, you know, the light um, uh, direction and range finder for emergency braking, pedestrian dis uh, um, detection, collision avoidance. And then you come to the first lot of cameras, which is traffic sign, razor, uh, recognition, and lane departure warning. Uh, and then uh, the short and medium term uh, radar uh, and then when you get very close to a car in a parking situation, you want to have ultrasonics. And then you've got the same thing on the side with the camera and at the back as well. Now, we all wish that we had eyes in the back of our heads. Well, we don't. Uh, but uh, an uh, autonomous car, of course, has got no problem uh, having um, um, cameras at the back of the car to be much more aware of uh, its surroundings. And this is one of the reasons um, why we all expect that autonomous cars will be a lot safer uh, than humans, uh, which, of course, isn't a very high bar, if we're honest about this. Um, and this will change uh, the insurance industry. Uh, it will change um, uh, the, uh, the way cars behave in, in quite a crowded situation. So one of the uh, companies that I've just funded called 5AI because it's a level five uh, autonomous uh, a software company. Uh, this is the highest level. It goes one, two, three, four, five, where five is self-driving in, in every uh, situation, including Oxford Street. So what do you need to do in Oxford Street to have a safe driving environment? Well, we figured out 
we have to track up to 200 entities. Uh, we need to track all the pedestrians on the right, all the pedestrians on the left, all the pedestrians in the middle, and in particular those pedestrians that look as if they're drunk because they might fall onto the, um, onto the uh, road when you don't want them to. Uh, you've got to track the bicycles, you've got to track, of course, all the other cars and the buses, uh, and you've got to uh, track the road signs and the uh, traffic lights. So there's a lot of tracking to be done, and it needs a lot of processing power. Uh, in fact, it needs more processing power than is available at the moment, uh, uh, but because of the upgrades with the IPUs that I described for you, I think they will be available just in time for the introduction of the car in two years' time. Why is this now possible? Well, there is a machine learning uh, technique called convolutional neural networks, CNNs, and they, well, the reason why they're called neural networks is because they work a bit like the brain. They work in a very parallel fas fashion. So the first thing, here is a, a typical neural network. Uh, it's, they're also called deep neural network because they have these layers of neurons, as indeed we have in the brain, where the first layer does this convolution just to, de to detect edges. So it's, it's, it's very simple to understand. Uh, everybody knows what an edge is, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the next one is getting a little bit uh, uh, more difficult uh, uh, and not, not so obvious because we as humans would then say, well, uh, you know, uh, you would uh, detect features like a nose or eyes or, or, or a head or something. Well, as it turns out, if you look into this, they've actually become very obscure. And the reason why we describe um, things like limbs or a rump or a head uh, is because we have these very detailed models of what a human looks like in our head. Uh, what actually happens in an, in, uh, 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 with our brains when we recognize a human is very different from the way we argue about it. Because when, when you look at, uh, at a person here in this room, you don't see clean outlines because the shades are often much more, uh, the shading of the face is much more uh, important than the, uh, than the normal features. So, uh, what happens here in this computer neural network is exactly reflecting what happens in our own brains. That you have these very obscure but very important features uh, that it pulls out, and by the time it comes to the last uh, level, it, it's clear that it knows that's a car. It's not a truck, it's not an airplane, it's not a ship or a, or a horse, it's a car. So this perception problem uh, that we've been working on for many years in artificial intelligence is basically a solved problem now, surprisingly. And uh, we now have uh, both speech recognition and optical recognition that is better than human. So a few more general remarks about machine learning. Um, we have just published a report that I can comment to you on machine learning, uh, which is a, a, a very a uh, readable uh, report on the power and promise of computers that learn by example. Uh, the first thing it does is defines uh, machine learning. What is machine learning? Uh, machine learning is really a system that learns from data rather than following pre-programmed rules. And that's quite a, a change. Uh, there are different levels of machine learning. The easiest one is supervised uh, machine learning where you have labeled data and you say, this is John and this is um, Mary, and you give lots of examples of John and Mary and they, they, they group it together. Unsupervised is a lot harder, where you don't tell them that it's John or Mary, uh, but they, it has to figure it out uh, themselves by looking uh, at lot of, lots of photographs. The next thing is uh, harder again. It's called reinforcement learning, where you have a reward function, like in a game. You have a score in a game. If it's higher, it's better, and if it's lower, it's, uh, it's worse. And then the hardest bit is uh, inverse uh, reinforcement learning, where you need much uh, greater data sets. And that's where you don't give the system a reward function, but the system has to figure the reward function out itself. Uh, by observing, say, what humans do. And uh, we've got some spectacular examples of uh, uh, machine uh, learning now. We now have speech recognition that is better than human. Uh, any of you who've played with Google uh, or Siri or Alexa can um, testify to that. We have object and face recognition, which is now better than human. 
Uh, this is a, a very recent breakthrough by Jeff Hinton in, uh, just uh, two years ago. And this allows us to do the scene analysis for cars that will enable uh, autonomous driving. And of course, all the recommender systems like Amazon and Netflix uh, also use machine learning um, at its core. Now, if there is one slide that I want you to remember, it's, uh, it's this slide, because it is the most fundamental slide of, of my talk. And it is the importance of probability as the fundamental concept of uh, machine learning. Uh, we've been seduced into thinking uh, that uh, the world, uh, in computer terms, consists of zeros and ones. Things are either true or they're, uh, they're false. Um, it's basically uh, a, 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 the illusion that we had for a very long time that you can describe uh, the world with first order predicate calculus. And it turns out that it only gives you a very uh, crude and um, imprecise uh, <clears throat> description of the world. If you are willing to forgo this crude idea that things are either false or true, they're either zeros and one, and embrace the idea that nothing is ever true or false, but they're all, if something is true, it just has a very high probability, and something is false, it's just a very low probability. Uh, 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 but if you allow all the shades of gray in between, it becomes a much more powerful description of what actually goes on in the real world. What do you give up? Well, you give up determinism, which people are very uncomfortable with because they always feel that computers ought to be deterministic. Uh, uh, and the world sort of becomes statistical. Uh, but what you gain is you don't need to program anymore. Uh, you you um, substitute programming by teaching. And what I mean by teaching is that you just present a very good training data set to the computer, and the computer will learn from it uh, what to do. But of course, it needs good, big data sets to uh, teach the computer what it's all about. The hardest problem uh, with this great uh, wealth of high quality simulations, though, is at the end of the day, you've got to give the system goals. And human goals have existed because of evolution. And they've served us very well because we are here. If they hadn't been so good, we would have died out. Uh, so there is a sort of existence proof by survival. Uh, now, we don't have such a thing for artificial machines um, yet, uh, at the moment, uh, we're allowed to set their goals. But the problem is, we're actually very bad at wishing for the right thing. It's the, it's the genie problem. So uh, wishing for the right thing, selecting the uh, right goals, and then devising uh, machines that will select their own goals in such a way that they, they will be nice to us is maybe the hardest problem to solve over the next um, few decades until we have super intelligences, as uh, most people in the field will expect by about 2050. So a few remarks about artificial intelligence. My neighbor, Steve Hawking, has said that the success in creating and AI would be the biggest event in human history. Unfortunately, it might also be the last unless we learn how to avoid the risks. And Elon Musk, who is the new Steve Jobs in Silicon Valley, has said, hope we're not just the biological bootloader for digital and superintelligence. Unfortunately, that is increasingly probable. So very bright, important people in the world think that AI is an important thing that is uh, about to happen. And it is already happening in a big way, in lots of uh, small ways, like uh, speech recognition. But the, the biggest uh, recent achievement has been won by Demis Hassabis, also a Cambridge graduate, uh, who uh, devised AlphaGo that beat uh, uh, Lisa Dahl, uh, who is the, 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 the best Go player in the world, in a match uh, in March uh, last year. And the reason why this is so out, an outstanding uh, uh, feat is because uh, everybody knew that there was no algorithm that would be good enough uh, to produce a good Go program because the number of Go situations, uh, the different Go, uh, a Go configurations that you can have on a Go board is uh, greater than the number of atoms in the universe. So it's, it's just such a huge, a complex uh, game. Um, 
uh, since we are in, in Hong Kong, how many, how many people are Go players here? Well, not so many, okay. Well, there are 40 million, uh, mainly in Asia. And uh, it's partially a game, uh, but it is uh, partially also a, uh, an art. And when people uh, watched move 37 in game two, which the, uh, the computer program um, played, Lisa Dole got up from his chair and walked around for 15 minutes because he couldn't make up his mind whether uh, this was pure genius or whether this was a bug in the program. As it turns out, it was pure genius, uh, and it won, it won the game. It was a very unusual move. It was a, a move that would only happen uh, uh, once every 10,000 times, as it turned out in a later analysis. And people who, very good Go player, said that this was a move that showed great intuition. And since Go players uh, you know, have a, a long tradition and these important moves sometimes define whole eras in the Go game, it's more like uh, discovering a new Picasso uh, rather than a, a, an algorithm. So this was quite a, an epochal event. In humanity's defense, Lee then played move uh, 78 in game four, which won him, uh, the only game that he won in the, in the five game uh, challenge. So uh, AlphaGo won it four to one, but uh, at least uh, one was won still by a human, which was equally ingenious uh, and also uh, was, and only had a chance of one in 10,000 to be played. So there is home, hope for humanity yet. But this will cause major disruptions. And I will just uh, give two examples. One, uh, my most successful company, uh, the Acorn Risk Machine, as it was originally called, now Advanced Risk Machines. And the uh, reason for the disruption comes uh, from the business model. So if you look during the Intel period, the PC period, uh, Intel produced the intellectual property, just like ARM, then did the design, just like ARM. But then Intel has its own fab and produces the chips. Uh, ARM does not have FAB. It only licenses companies like TSMC, the Taiwanese uh, Semiconductor Corporation, and 450 other licensees. And it is that change in the business model from a uh, chip selling model to a licensing model that allowed us to completely dominate the smartphone market with a 95% market share. So uh, companies like Tel and HP would buy microprocessors from Intel, uh, Samsung, Apple, uh, et cetera, uh, don't want to be a bio-microprocessors. They want to license it from ARM uh, and have uh, uh, licenses for their smartphones. So this is our latest uh, microprocessor, the ARM Cortex, um, the A72, which is in the iPhone 7 and the um, Samsung uh, 8. And here is the comparison between ARM and uh, Intel. So we have now cumulatively shipped 100 billion uh, ARMs. I, I still can't believe this number. It's an unbelievable number. It's 10 times more than people on Earth. So every one of you has at least 10 ARMs. So you might well ask, well, where are my 10? And the answer is they're in here, because uh, one of these has, on average, 20 ARMs. So it's not just the microprocessor that does the, uh, uh, the, 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 the program. Uh, that runs the programs, but it's the microprocessor and the Bluetooth device and the Wi-Fi device and the U USB uh, and so on. Unfortunately, the company was sold to SoftBank last year for 30 billion. Uh, it was a very successful uh, sale, of course, but uh, I wished uh, uh, we, would, we could have hung on to the only British company that's, that has uh, a high-tech company that has, that has global relevance. Uh, but. Uh, uh, SoftBank uh, paid a very good price, so uh, the financial markets, of course, uh, uh, we're happy to sell it to SoftBank. We have a 95% market share in phones. We are outselling Intel uh, 20 to 1 uh, per year, so we uh, sell 20 times more processors uh, in a year than Intel. We're going to uh, ship about uh, 15 billion this year. And we've got 450 licensees. But since 2010, the value of the ARM uh, uh, chips that are being sold by our licensees 
has overtaken Intel revenues. It's not just the number of arms that we sell every year, it's also the value of them that has uh, uh, overtaken Intel. Now, the most important uh, effect is to be seen on the car industry, though. Uh, and this is the, uh, the, the car stack. Customers would go into a showroom to buy a car. In the future, they just go and uh, buy transport as a service from Uber or 5AI or any of its uh, competitors. So it's buying a car versus transport as a service, spending 20,000 euros uh, rather than just 10 euros when you get up in your restaurant uh, and you spend 10 euros by going to the exit and, and using one of the uh, service companies. So the old criteria uh, were things like the engine, the new criteria is the battery. It was fuel consumption, now it is range. The brand turns to the service, and the cost of the car is irrelevant. What people want is the cost of the trip. And parking and the garage, uh, which was important in the past, uh, is replaced by life integration. And this is the, the most staggering slide in terms of the valuation of these new companies. Uh, look at Apple, which of course is the most valuable company, four times sales, but Uber has a 12 times sales value at 70 billion, and together with Tesla at 55 billion, is worth more than General Motors, and the same as Mercedes, who have got sales multiples of a half, and a third. Look at this number. Just the cash that Apple has is 250 billion. So if, if Apple wanted to buy Mercedes, they could do so uh, with just less than a third of their cash. So what we're seeing here is that our own evolution is now uh, overtaken uh, by intelligent uh, design, starting with Aristotle, and um, a Bayes, uh, because a lot of the mathematics of this is Bayesian uh, arithmetic, Alan Turing, a member of my college, who defined computing, and now uh, artificial intelligence. So in conclusion, uh, we have a new partner, uh, and uh, they are intelligent machines. Uh, the problem to be solved is how do we co-evolve with them over the next few years? And how will we deal with the disruption in a number of industries, not just the car industry, but also the finance industry and the pharma industry, and responsible translation of these uh, key uh, new techniques uh, will be the key. Thank you very much. I think we might have run out of time. As, uh, I don't know if there's any time for... We have about uh, five minutes for questions. Okay. And uh, the difficult task is to be able to uh, ask <laughs> questions that can be answered in five minutes. I mean, all I can think <laughs> about is, you know, pick up Dr. House's brain and uh, compare that with uh, maybe uh, Jeremy Clarkson, but <laughs> uh, that is not the issue. So open to the floor, uh, a few questions. Gentlemen here and then here. So, Anders Carlsen Elsevier, we are using machine learning a lot, just as you know. Um, there is an interesting question posed by the director of Sony Computer Science Lab. He posed the question, when will an AI come with a Nobel Prize worthy discovery? And I want to ask this question to you. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the, the only thing that I can repeat is this um, idea of superintelligences uh, that are, that are smarter than us in every respect, uh, everything that we do. And the consensus amongst the machine learning and the AI community is that this will happen around 2050. So if you believe that sort of general feeling that maybe around 2050 we'll have a Nobel Prize that is being uh, uh, won by, by an AI. But um, you know, this is difficult to predict. Uh, do you have a mic here? Coming up. Uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about is that much of the advance that has happened with AI is a particular stream of AI called weak AI. There are specific tasks that we are trying to do uh, as opposed to strong AI, which is more general purpose intelligence. The progress hasn't been there. 
And most of the advance in weak AI, which has been tremendous, actually has been driven by Moore's law. The algorithms haven't changed that much. Yes, there have been incremental advances. So it's been driven by Moore's law. Moore's law is likely to come to like, you know, slow down by 2020, 2022, when it gets to five nanometers for silicon chips. And before the investment in gallium arsenide photonic chips comes in, there will be a hiatus. One thing you didn't probably raise was that in the short to medium term, technologies like blockchain in combination with AI will be much bigger disruptors than AI and machine learning alone. And the beauty of blockchain, it does not depend on Moore's law continuing. Okay, there are three differences that I have with you. Uh, uh, although I agree with you that Moore's law is coming to an end, and as I already said, uh, there is um, uh, already a topping out on the speed side because at three gigahertz, uh, we've had three gigahertz now for almost 10 years. So there's the actual processing power of the single processor is not proceeding uh, anymore. However, the performance of chips and the performance of computers will continue to, ri uh, to rise despite the fact that Moore's law doesn't hold anymore because of the introduction of parallelism. So the, uh, the progress that I see coming is in uh, parallelizing, uh, in particular, machine learning um, algorithms. We have not been very successful with parallelizing algorithms in the past. And the reason for that is uh, that there is no generic way of parallelizing algorithms. Luckily, for machine learning and AI, since they have to work on very large data set, there is a natural way of parallelizing it. So uh, parallelizing, parallelization maps very well onto, um, onto uh, machine learning and AI. And that's the second disagreement that I have with you, uh, that nothing has changed in algorithms, and therefore uh, we're not really making much progress. Your statement is absolutely right. The algorithms haven't improved a lot. Uh, when um, I had uh, Jeff Hinton, one of the stars in AI, give uh, a, a talk at the machine learning seminar that I organized at the Royal Society, he gave three reasons uh, why, this, uh, why AI is finally working so well as it does. Uh, the first reason is more compute power, which was helpful, but he thought that was the least important. The second was slight improvements in algorithms, but they, they've been around for a long time. But the thing that really made the difference was the availability of these very large data sets. So it's really the data-driven um, breakthroughs that have allowed uh, speech recognition and object re recognition uh, to be so important. The last point that you made, though, uh, uh, I also agree with that the, the blockchain uh, will revolutionize uh, not just the financial industry, but with smart contracts, a number of other industries as well. However, uh, a blockchain can also absorb very large amounts of processing power uh, if, you want to, um, uh, uh, if you want to implement it properly. So I agree and disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> a very learned questions, a very learned answers. I mean, with that pause of the three seconds before uh, Dr. Hauser answers that question, and I don't know whether that trillions uh, uh, computations that is going on into your mind. But uh, with that uh, final comment, do you want to have the last eight? The biggest driver of Moore's law is probably going to be Bitcoin mining more than anything else. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.